Do you ever feel like HR is just a roadblock full of paperwork and policies that don't actually drive the business forward? What if I told you there is a way to make HR not just a necessary evil, but a critical engine for your company's growth. Today, I'm gonna to show you how to completely transform HR into a people strategy that allows you to scale your business through your team. And it's focused on performance. Let me share a quick story with you. A client of mine, growing startup, they were struggling with constant turnover and disengagement. And after we implemented a people strategy tailored to their business needs, they not only retained key talent, but they also increased revenue by 31% because we focused on performance. This strategy has helped multiple companies just like yours turn people operations into profit driving systems. I'm Steve, founder of Think HR and Insurance Services, and I help businesses just like yours take HR from basic compliance function to a powerful people strategy that's entirely focused on performance and grow. My goal is to help you leverage your team to generate more equity faster. With over a decade of experience, I've worked with venture-backed startups and companies across different industries all over the world. I've helped hundreds of clients align their people strategy with their business goals, transforming HR into a profit-driving machine because we are entirely focused on performance. My work has resulted in measurable success, increased revenue, improved employee retention, and happier investors. Stick with me till the end. I want to show you how to align your people with the business goals so that you can drive real results. So right now, most companies are still using HR the old way. They're focused on compliance and throwing handbooks at people and outdated processes that don't actually drive results because they're not focused there. And here's why that's a problem. Number one, you're losing money by seeing HR as just an operating expense. Number two, you're missing opportunities to drive business performance through your team. That's the key to scale. And number three, you may be stuck reacting to issues rather than proactively driving growth in your organization, right? Many founders think, you know, we're too small for an advanced HR strategy, but it's that thinking that's holding your business back. By not addressing these issues now, you're not only bleeding money, but you're also missing out on growth opportunities. Many businesses fall into the trap of thinking they can solve their people problems with generic solutions like an off-the-shelf HR software or a cookie-cutter employee handbook. These solutions don't work because they don't align with your specific business goals and they don't tell your people how to do their job. <laughs> Our approach is a little different. It's customized. We're focused on performance, actionable steps. We want to design this HR department or this people strategy to help you win by making people operations work for your business, not against your business. Let me show you how. So now I want to walk you through the people performance framework. We use this with all of our clients because this is the modern way to do HR. This framework is how we design the entire HR department in the most efficient way possible because this focuses on performance, but it allows us to define performance in a way that connects people to the business objectives. But before we dive into how this system works, we need to understand the old way of doing HR. So let's zoom in. The old way of doing HR is focused mostly on compliance, paperwork, and policies that don't help employees do their jobs or solve real world problems in any way. It's often reactive. It responds to issues only after they've escalated. And people tend to view HR like the principal's office. You know, it's full of red tape and bureaucracy. And this outdated approach stifles creativity and it abolishes innovation because it fails to connect the employee to the business in a meaningful way. In contrast, the people performance framework clarifies what it means for employees to perform in the context of your business. It ensures that HR is connecting employees to the business context at all times. This makes it very clear on how each person's role directly impacts business outcomes. So let's dive into the business context next. Okay, the business context is key. How the business owner designs the company to make money shapes its operations. And the operations are what define the roles and responsibilities of each employee that works for you. So to fully understand this, we need to put into context two financial statements, the balance sheet and the income statement. The balance sheet shows the company's financial health. It shows its assets, its liabilities, and really the main point of a company is to create more equity to the owners. And the owners are comprised of the founders, 
employees, investors, the board, all that. And this equity number, quite frankly, it's in a lot of ways, whatever the goal of the company is, it, it's up to these people to decide what they want. And whatever they want, right? If they want to increase this, double it, triple it, whatever it is, the way that the company operates tells them how they're going to be able to make that happen. Because they have to be able to take the working capital that they have. They need to be able to take, uh, sometimes you have to take debt or loans in order to invest in the company, to prepare it to get big enough to be $20 million and move up to $100 million. There's a lot of things that need to happen in here. And the reason why it's so important to understand this is the income statement tells you how the company is making money versus how they're spending money. And employees do affect both sides of this equation. For example, they contribute to revenue through sales, service, or product development. And they also incur costs. It's HR's job to work with ownership to figure out how do we align employee performance with revenue growth and then also cost management. So when HR is focused on aligning people strategy with financial outcomes, they're ensuring that the employee adds measurable value to the company, right? And a lot of times with the old way of doing HR, you'll hear people say, especially from the HR department, I don't have a seat at the table. And if I do, I certainly don't have a voice at the table. It's that system where if your chief people officer or the person in charge of HR or a lack of an HR team, if there's no way for employees to have a feedback loop on how their job can be easier, the feedback that they have, they're actually doing the jobs. There's a big disconnect sometimes from what founders or even upper management or anything can see from you know the ground floor. A lot of the gold in the company is right here inside of the people because they're in the day-to-day -day operations. They're doing the work that's driving these numbers. They've got a lot of answers. So it's our job to figure out how do we take what our goals are for the equity of the company? What assets do we have in place? And what debt or liabilities are we going to have to take on in order to make this operation produce the results that drive this equity number? So that is why it is so important to understand this. Now, let me relate this back to people. Again, like revenue. Revenue is marketing, sales, um, you know, product development, service people, anything that where people are influencing money coming in. Cost of goods sold or cost of service, right? That is the cost to achieve and get this revenue. A lot of times when you look here and then you have a gross profit and then operating expenditures are, what do you need in the business overhead? All that accounting team, IT, all that. Is it in-house? Is it external? Is it fractional? You know, all those things do matter. And then that ends up giving you an operating profit or an operating income. For you to operate at this revenue number, this is how much that costs. And connecting it back over here and the reason why sometimes it makes sense for investors to put more money into the liabilities, invest more and hire more people, right? Now we're increasing our liabilities here to the company. And like when we're doing that, we're, we're putting money into the company and we're sharing some of the equity or we're taking on debt. And when we do that, it's in the hopes that if we can grow the company and we invest money in more people, we can actually drive more business. But those are the types of things that we need to you know, consider when we're looking at a business, whether it's tech or anything. And a lot of times in tech, what you'll see is if there's a pre-revenue company and they don't have the MVP built yet, well, then they're not making revenue. They're pre-revenue. And when they're pre-revenue, they need to monitor their cost of how much is it costing to get these engineers in? How good are we at recruiting the right people for the job? Or how long does it take us to recruit somebody from a company that we look up to in our industry as being a leader? So like an example might be, how do we get this person from SpaceX to come over and help us develop this very specific radar system? How do we do that? We need some of their knowledge share, right? That all starts to put other pieces of the pie into context, which is the employee life cycle. That's where we start to connect some of the dots here. The reason why we want to look at the employee life cycle is when we take into the context, the business's needs. We need to look at the employee life cycle because this is the employee experience. And when you look at the employee's experience or the employee's life cycle, you have recruiting and hiring. That is everything that happens before day one. Your recruiting and hiring is going to be very dependent on if I'm working at SpaceX right now and I'm making really good money and I love my title, I 
love my job. Why would I come work for you? You need to have a very good pitch. And that may mean that you need to offer up more cash or offer up more equity. But then you need to consider before we do that, we need to understand, well, what are the goals of the business? Can we afford to do that? Is that within the budget? That's why it's really important to think and consider the business context when you're touching any piece of your HR system or your people performance system. Now, we're going to review what employee life cycle means, and then we're going to get into the levels of people performance so that you can understand how we build HR differently. The old way of doing HR is pretty much just, hey, let's get everything in place and miss risk mitigation and compliance and handbooks. No, 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 no. We, we can't do it that way when we really look at the business context. That's what's driving the rift between people. And whether we like it or not, HR is always around because if there is people, we are talking about the relationship between the ownership and their desires for the company and the people that are operating the business. And that relationship is very important. So these, the people performance framework allows us to take problems and create solutions inside of the business context. And we use the employee life cycle to be able to identify where the problem is. And then that's how we get to the levels of people performance. So let me let me go into the employee life cycle so we could be clear on what that means. So uh, recruiting and hiring before day one. Onboarding, you're getting acclimated to how the company works. This is where you might take like your, um, you know, your trainings, you get access to computer, all that information. And you also have to decide, I mean, day one, do we need them up and running? If so, then we need to get the, a lot of the onboarding done prior to day one. And what are some things that are reasonable for us to do before day one to get these people off and running? Then once they're acclimated to the company, you want to get them in more role specific development. And this is what starts to shape their um like how they're trained to do their job that you hired them for the skills in the context of your company the more information we have and the more clarity we have about what that role is designed to do and why we were willing to pay whatever we were able to pay for that role to be in-house we need to be able to communicate that information to this person then performance management comes into play once that person is ramped up they're able to do the job to the specs that we desire then Cool. We need to manage their performance. Why? Because we need to do, know if they're doing good, bad, if there's feedback. Is there information that we need to know? If we need to make changes in our budget, if we need to make uh, additional hires, or we need to take somebody and then we need to move into a, a change of role, right? Performance management is very important because it helps you identify the person's skill set that you hired them for and benchmark that against the business's needs long term, immediate, short term. That's all determined by the budget and you know the uh, business context. But then that's how we figure out, do we need to change somebody's role? Are they moving down? Are they moving up? Are they moving across the organization? That's a very important piece to consider. Also, you want to start thinking through your offboarding and exiting. It is very important, especially at tech companies. But you really need to decide like what is important if somebody's leaving the company? What do they have access to? How do we need to go about our offboarding process? And also, we want to really understand like why did they leave? Was it voluntary? If it was, was it a better opportunity? Was it um, that you know you outgrew the job? Um, was it you know the culture? What, what was the feedback? All information and feedback that we can get from this just allows us to make this entire experience better, which should make the company's people perform better because you're making the job easier. And there needs to be that feedback loop where people feel as though the company is really doing its best to facilitate them doing their job. And then post-employment. A lot of people don't think about this early stages, but think about it this way. Somebody left voluntarily for another job. And let's just say that, you know, they still have access to a lot of the people that, you know, are in their networks. In sales, this happens quite often. You know, do you want them to be a part of like an alumni association? You see people with like X Twitter, X Meta, X X, <laughs> you know, um, X Google, right? And why is that? Well, it's because working at that company meant something to people. And it means something to people outside of the organization as well. Now, what does it mean for somebody to have worked at your company? In the beginning stages, it may feel as though this is a million years away. And this is a perfect segue into why the levels of people performance become very important. Now, I'm going to show you over here the levels of people performance. This is an expanded version so that we can see some different ways in which this works. This levels of people performance allows us to identify what is important to build in our HR 
strategy right now? What's going to serve the people and the business? And this right here really helps us filter it. So let's go through it. So the levels of people performance, there's three sections. At the bottom, we have required, and then we get into performance. And then up here, this is optimized. This is when everything's going well, this, this is how we want our business to, to work. So I'm going to go through these different levels in a little more detail with you so that you can understand how we use this as a tool to efficiently build our people performance systems, right? Our HR department. How do we build this efficiently? So let's go here to the red. So in the red, we have required and there's three levels. Level one is foundation of HR. This is compliance with local, state, and federal labor laws. And this means that, hey, as a company, and look, I'm assuming that all companies want to act in good faith. And if you're watching this, I'm assuming it's because, hey, you don't want HR to be a nightmare, but you are, you do want to be a compliant employer. And I recommend all employers do because these laws are a baseline of just decency that is demanded by the government in order for you to be an employer. High level, this is compliance with like wage and hour laws. Are you paying people the right wage or minimum wage? Are you paying them on time? You know, some people like to pay monthly. Not all professions are allowed to do monthly. Most people need to be paid at least once every 15 days. And then in some industries, it may be different. You also might have different um, equal opportunity employment regulations that are put on you as you're going through the different levels of growth. Like at 20 employees, you have different regulations than you do at 5,000 employees. When you're a startup, sometimes you have to decide between, am I really worried about being an applicable large employer right now and i'm at my first three or four hires and i don't plan to hire more than 10 people in the next two years no right but you do want to get the fundamentals down you want to make sure that people are getting paid properly that is a level one that is the first priority you have when you have people at your company you want to make sure that they are paid you want to make sure that it is a fair and equal employment opportunity for people. You're not discriminating in any way, shape or form. You also want to make sure that you're creating a safe environment and that you have workers comp insurance and workers comp is very important to have. Why? Because if something happens to somebody while they're working and they go to the emergency room, that is not going to their personal health insurance. It should go to the workers' comp policy. That's why you need to have it in place. And that's usually where a lot of employers, especially maybe in tech, um, you know, they missed the boat there. And FMLA, you know, if somebody gets, uh, you know, sick and needs to take care of a family member, what policies do you have in place to handle that, right? These are all level one concerns because this is where the government is saying you need to abide by these rules, okay? And level two, level two is employee accessibility. So that's documentation, acknowledgement, and access. And believe it or not, even though we're in the required section, all this stuff needs to be in place before the employee even starts, <laughs> really, most, most places. You need to be ahead of the game here. This, the acknowledgement place, how you introduce this information, how you handle the foundations is everything that starts your relationship with your employees. So what do I mean by that? This is the employee handbook. Is it just a handbook? Here you go. You know, everybody's complaining. It, it connects to nobody. It means nothing. Or is the em employee handbook truly a guide that helps you figure out, hey, what are the resources I have in this company? What are the rules? What do I do if I want to take a day off? Cause I'm really tired. You know, what if my manager um, doesn't approve my time? What, what happens next? Who do I go to? You know, the employee handbook, it's the first thing that if there's any dispute between you and employee, they usually want to pull the handbook because this is what sets the rules and the employee handbook better be up to code and have at least all the level one things in there. But how you communicate this to people is really important. This starts to shape how you work with your employees, you know, how you do your onboarding and employee uh, documentation, their I-9s, their W-4s. You know, I know a lot of tech companies when they first start off, nothing makes a engineer more upset than to come to a company. Their goal is to revolutionize whatever it might be. And then they have to fill out their first, last name, their spouse's name, their address on 15 different forms, the same information. It's going to drive them crazy. So this in level two is really like the first place where you're giving employees access to information. So you need to understand how do you want to deliver that information to your employees, right? That's what level two is. So this can be found in your HIS system, your payroll systems, 
your documentation, your internal comm, all that stuff, it's, it's all right here. How do you let the employee create the documentation, acknowledge and access it in the future? How do you do that? This is the start of your relationship with them and it's required. And then the other piece, level three, how do you continually remain proactive? You want to have continuous updates. You want to have a way to integrate your employee handbook or any legal requirements that are constantly changing because these are not static. This is level one, two, and three is not static. It's not. Laws change all the time and it's constant updates. And the more regulated your industry, the more this is going to be important. And that's why it's important to have regular updates. You should look at many of your documents as living, breathing documents, meaning that they're constantly being updated and they need to be acknowledged. You want to make sure like if possible, you get the right automation and tools in place so that you don't really need to think about updating these things all the time. An example might be, hey, if you don't have somebody that's focused on HR and you need at least a baseline level of compliance and legal and stuff, then maybe we look at a professional employer organization or we get a legal counsel or a subscription to a service that allows us to constantly update this stuff. So all this stuff is required, level one, two, and three. And you want to make sure that you understand what is required. And a lot of times that does require you know, a village, right? You might need help from a lawyer that you work with that's familiar with labor law. You might need to have a really good broker for insurance. You need to have a good accountant and you certainly need a good HR team, but you need to have all these things in place. That's required. Now, next level, performance. Once we have the fundamentals down, you know, like the basic stuff, then we want to start looking at performance. And performance has three levels as well. Now, the thing about performance is this, it starts with talent forecasting and workforce analytics. That sounds like a buzzword, but really what it is, is you need to, one, create a budget. You need to forecast cost. Again, business context. We need to put this into business context. How many people do we need on staff? What is? How much is it going to cost for us to open up that new office? That's important. And that's why one of the first things we want to focus on is talent forecasting and workforce analytics. Level five, we get into employee engagement and retention strategies. And we'll get into this in a little more detail in a moment, but employee engagement and retention strategies are, are not just surveys. It's not a survey monkey you send out. Hey, what do you want for lunch? Hey, you know, do you want a foosball table? Hey, what do you think about us having like, you know, drinks Friday night or a company uh, outing? That's not employee engagement. That's not what we're talking about yet. It's a part of what we're talking about, but we're talking about how do we put this in the context of the business? And then level six, it seems like an extension of this, but it is different. The continuous performance management and development is us going from a budget and a forecast and a way to receive information on our budget and forecast financially and our hypothesis on how this should go. And then the employee engagement and retention is designed for us to create a feedback loop that incentivizes employees to give us information and feedback on how to do their job better. How can we remove obstacles? How can we make it easier for them? Where are the missing pieces that we don't have from the top of the business that you have? You have all the insights. You're in the foxhole, right? You're doing all these things. And we'll get into that in a little bit here. But continuous performance management and development is when we take these two items, the feedback, the forecast, and the budget to actuals, and we say to ourselves, okay, how do we start? What systems are most important for us to figure out? And with these systems, that's how we start creating learning and development. That's how we start creating our, our different like ways in which we drive performance, right? So let's get into some of these. Level four, talent forecast and workforce analytics. So workforce planning is deciding as a business, what's the strategy? We think we have a good market overseas, but it might make sense for us to keep all the team here in the U.S., We'll keep it domestic. We don't want to hire any international people quite yet. Okay, well, then we want a workforce plan around where are these people going to be? If they're in Indiana versus New York City, we might need a different comp strategy because the cost of living in Indiana versus New York City, completely different, right? The skill gap analysis, we want to understand, well, before we hire people, what skills do we need in the company and what are needs that we have now versus strategically, what needs are we going to have in the near future? So, as an example, we might say to ourselves, you know, we're raising money right now and right now we outsource our accounting, but we can't quite afford a CFO. So what we're going to do is 
we're going to hire a analyst or associate level finance person to come in and help us build our models. And we're going to develop them into a CFO because we have a very clear goal on how we want to do that. And that can really be a part of your workforce planning strategy. It also helps out with budgeting and comp because you're not having to pay a CFO um, equity and all those things in the beginning. And you may still be able to get much of the work done that the business needs, right? As you're moving along, or you might have somebody who's a brilliant marketer, but you need them to dive deep into sales so that they can become a better marketer. And that's really how you start doing your workforce planning, your comp strategy, your skill gap analysis, and then diversity and inclusion. This should always be embedded in anyone's strategy. Are you missing out on perspectives that quite frankly are very valuable? You want to make sure that this is always embedded in the way in which you plan out your workforce planning. So that's from your interview process to your comp strategy, to how you source people. And that goes back to your employee life cycle over here, right? Okay. So level four, talent forecasting and workforce analytics. It's really about budgeting, forecasting, and creating the groundwork or a baseline of what you expect to happen, what you expect to need as far as talent and people in your organization. Level five. Now, employee engagement and retention strategies. First, employee well-being programs. Here's the thing. If you really want to drive down costs, you can drive people to 20-hour days sleepless nights, seven days a week, not pay them, do all that stuff, or even pay them up. And people are going to get burnt out. And when they get burnt out, you have all this IP, you have all this information in there. And how are you going to keep growing the business? They're not robots. You haven't really created a system quite yet where you can replace them with AI or anything else, right? Maybe not quite yet. You're not all the way there. And employee well-being programs are not like a, just about like, oh, we need to have like a, a nap room. It's about what do the employees need in order to be happy because you might find that your team loves to work. In fact, they get a, they get a rush out of helping each other out, solving problems. But you need to understand from the employees, how do they view well-being? What do they need to perform well? And this is why we want to have you know proactive employee feedback. We want to have loops. The same thing we would want to do with our customers in what's working? Why did you buy? You know, what could we be doing better? How can we improve? What's the biggest issue that we're having, um, you know, with the service or what? All those types of things need to be in your DNA of your company, because if you're doing that with customers, but you're not doing that internally, eventually the people who are serving your customers will not be able to do that with your customers because they're the ones operating the business. So if that's the experience you want for your customers, then you need to make sure that you're doing that with your employees, which you know, from the proactive employee feedback, this is where you can start to do career development and growth opportunities, figure out, hey, you know, are there people in the organization that want to get out of sales and they want to get into operations? Well, how do you identify that? How do you prepare them for that? How do you align them to the timing of the business context where we can cross them over? You don't want to be in the busiest selling season of your company's uh, financial year or fiscal year and move somebody from sales to operations, right? Yeah, that may not make a lot of sense. So, you know, we really want to plan some of these things out and communicate with our employees on what career development and growth opportunities look like in our organization, which brings me to recognition and rewards. So we want to strategize on how we create not only a comp strategy, but a total recognition and reward program that employees actually want. We don't want to just force these things on them. That's not what people performance is all about. It's about you design a recognition and rewards program based off of the proactive employee feedback that you're getting on what they want. And it's not just, hey, we want a, a retreat for everyone. Give us a retreat. No, 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 no. This is we need to put this in the context of the business. It would be nice if we can have a retreat. We can have a retreat if we meet this goal. That's a reward. That's like president's club. And you don't know what's going to motivate people. Certainly, if I'm not the one working in that role, then I just need to ask them what's going to motivate them. And you'd be very surprised at what some people are looking for. All right. So that's why it's important to one. We have our company's goals and agenda, but then we loop in the employees. And that is really how we're defining employee engagement and retention strategies. So now we have our budget. We have our forecast. We have tracks laid out to where we can see how much our costs and how much it's costing us to operate and what performance is starting to mean. And now we want to build on that, right? We can, we can track what our budget to actual is, meaning we assume this is how much we have to pay an employee to get 
this type of performance back. And we'll see that in the income statement, right? High level, you'll see your total company's budget versus actual money in. And that's when finance can come in and help out. And then we have our employee uh, engagement and feedback. And if we've been properly looping in their feedback, we should put that into considerations back into workforce planning, comp strategy, skill gap analysis process, and how we can make sure that there's more diversity and inclusion along the way. And once we start to have these feedback loops working, right, they're really working, they're doing well, we're getting information now, now we've got an HR system. Now we're starting to ascend from the required information, the required stuff of HR and people management to the next level of performance, which is continuous performance management and development. So that is an extension of level five, but level six is creating ongoing feedback and coaching. So now you might have a training department, right? Learning and development team, at goal alignment and flexibility, meaning like, hey, now we've got so many people that have done sales here and we've got a lot of people who have been successful. And from the ongoing coaching and feedback, these are the skills and things that these people think would have made them better faster and we're going to put that into our learning and development program so that we could drive a better comp strategy, a better workforce plan, a strategic workforce plan to hire the attributes of people that make the most sense. And then we're going to use this as a feedback mechanism from the top performers. And then we're going to create our learning and development systems in our organization so that we have a true performance feedback loop. And when these three things are humming and they're doing really well i'm going to show you what's exciting what's exciting is we move to level seven right the optimized section of our people performance system or our hr department level seven and level seven is comprised of two areas and this is the feedback loop it it's basically you're taking data driven hr decisions and you're building a company, really a company culture of innovation and agility. But you can't have innovation, you can't have creativity when we're not doing the required things. When we're bleeding at the foot, you know, it's hard to be, you know, thinking about the next level of ascension, the, the top level things. And if we want to have a culture of innovation, it's going to take people to be in a space, a creative mindset. And in order to get them to a creative mindset, we have to go through all of these levels first, right? We have to do, we have to pay people on time because look, I'm not thinking about like, how can I be the best at my job if I'm not getting paid? If I don't even know how to find where to, you know, submit a uh, my time off for, you know, to spend time with my family. And I, I'm just like, no way am I thinking about this stuff creatively. I'm not in that headspace, I'm drowning. Right. And then the performance, if I don't know what performance looks like for me, why should I give my creative energy to you? I'm not even in that space, you know, so to really get the best performance out of people, we want to get to this optimized level. But this optimized level, the data is highly dependent on setting up all the performance measurements correctly. And it's highly dependent on doing everything that we are required to do so that we can have the proper budget so that we can put the proper people in place at the right time. How much would it suck to build the company to 10 million and find out, gosh, you know, we were paying people wrong the last five years and we're subject to a class action lawsuit and it's gonna cost us 50 million. Oh, ooh. oh man, we're not thinking about being optimized anymore, right? So let's go over level seven in a little more detail. So you wanna build a culture of innovation and agility. So that means you wanna have agile HR practices, which means that you are not only focused on how to drive in innovation, but you're able to speed up the feedback loops, right? Where an employee says, this isn't working. And then HR is able to take that information and very quickly adopt to it as an example. Hey, you know what? We're not getting paid the correct amount. In fact, most people in our industry are getting paid like 20% more. Well, that could cause people to go move and leave. But 
Eventually, if we get to the point where we have agile HR practices and that employee's concern is not met with, you know, oh, well, we'll see if we could put it in the budget next year, but it's very quickly, hey, we did a compensation benchmark and guess what, everybody, we're going to give you a 15% raise or a 20% raise to match the market. We really value you as employees and we were able to do that. Why? Well, because we were able to establish our compensation, how it is, and we've gotten to the point where we've got enough data on how we're performing performing and what we need as a company to perform from people. And we could increase our performance needs as a company in order to compensate people more. But money doesn't just come out of the sky. It's got to make sense. It's got to be something that really does drive this forward. So that's how you take compensation benchmarking in this scenario as a data point. Uh, you'll look at like other companies, you'll look at people in your industry, you'll look at like what cities they're in. And if you're able to get that information before it becomes a, uh, a something that somebody's feeding back to you, then what you're doing essentially is you're going to build a culture of innovation and agility because they're not worried about those things. The companies like or the employees are saying, man, my company's got my back. I got a 20% raise and I didn't even need to ask for it, right? And if you do enough of level four and five and you get the right engagement, right, this eventually becomes data and information. This becomes almost a data lake of great information. And you can pull that information and put it in the context of the business and then push out solutions to the employees more quickly. You can also create innovation incentives. You can do change management programs. You can do employer branding differently. Why? Because you're building a brand of, man, this company takes care of me. As, as an example, a lot of people that work at Apple or Google or Facebook, Meta, right? I was an ex-Google person and that means something to somebody or an ex-Uber person. That really means something to somebody. Why? Well, because they do a lot of things that make sense and people know that Working there means that you must be a high performer. You must drive a lot of value in some way, shape, or form. The ideas and the experience that you had there, if you brought that to our company, man, we would really be able to use that and we'd be able to make some good money together. Right. So that is that is essentially how you want to get to this level. But getting to this level, again, it does require a lot of work. We have to do the basics. We have to do what's required because doing all the legal things properly and making sure that people aren't worried about whether or not the uh, OSHA is going to come in and shut everybody down and we all lose our jobs. Right. We want to make sure all the required things are happening. I want to make sure I'm getting paid so I don't need to worry about that. And then we need to make sure that things like even payroll, all that, it needs to roll up into a budget so that we can create these forecasts. We can start figuring out how much does it really cost to do all the right things. And now once we do all the right things and we know how much that costs, how do we drive performance? Where do we invest in to get more out of our people? And then once we've done that enough and we have a great feedback loop between our budget and what's really happening and how we drive performance, and then we create a system to make that go faster, then we'll be able to create data lakes of information through different HRIS technologies. That's when we start getting into the fun stuff. <laughs> and then we can start doing more predictive analytics. We can start saying, hey, based off of where we're at right now in our company, we'll probably see a significant growth in sales. You know, let's focus on growing that sales organization. Let's fix anything we need to fix. Let's push out these different incentives that we can, where we can say, hey, let's start. Hey, you've been identified as somebody that we think would be great for leadership. Why? Because the data shows, shows us this. Other people in our company, Company that have your attributes, have your tenure, all these things, they want leadership. Is that something you want? Great. See, now you have a full ecosystem that's making your people <laughs> perform. That, that's just it. Let's talk about how we can use this system real quick. So people performance framework, we have a problem. What's the problem? Hey, I didn't get paid on time. I didn't get my check. Okay, well, what's the problem? I didn't get paid on time. That's the check. And the reason why we want to look at an employee life cycle is because, well, when did it happen? Because if the problem happened when I was onboarding versus when I was offboarding, those are two completely different problems. I'll explain. So if we take it through, we know that let's just say it was from offboarding. I have an employee in California and I'm offboarding and I didn't receive my check on the way out. It was my last day of work and I should have gotten paid. Okay, well, what people performance level is that at? And by the way, the solution is pay the person. They did the work, pay them what you own, right? That's the solution. <laughs> but we wanna know in our system, why did this happen? So we need to go to off board and exit. And then we go to our levels and paying people is definitely required. Maybe it's part of performance, but not really. It's really required. You need to pay that person. In California, they require you to pay the person on their last day, then it's a level one problem. Now that we've identified in our framework, 
where the problem is. Now we know specifically, hey, is this a one-off situation? If we only have six employees and we only lose one person a year, then I don't think it's really that valuable to put an entire system together or automate a bunch of things. That might not make sense because why are we automating something that only happens once a year, right? We may want to set a protocol for when you let somebody go, this is the protocol, right? But that doesn't mean we need to invite technology in, into the system. That doesn't mean that we really need to invite additional costs into the system that don't really serve the business's needs. And that's like a perfect example of how you can identify the problem. You know, it's an issue. It's a level one. We have to fix it. And, you know, we're all good. Now, let's take the other problem that we had, which is like more of a morale problem, right? Let's just say the sales team believes we should have a president's club, but we're not at the point yet where we can afford it. And let's just say that the marketing team, they have offsites once a quarter. And if the marketing team has offsites once a quarter and the sales team wants president's club, they may say the company is showing favoritism to the marketing team. Whoa, well, what's the problem? Let's take it through the life cycle. So the problem is sales wants a president's club. And if we look in the employee life cycle, that means that we are talking about really performance management. How are we rewarding performance? We're doing well, we should have a president's club. But it also means that the marketing team, you know, why are they having offsites once a quarter? Is it part of the business plan? Is there truly favoritism in there? Well, let's look at the people performance level now and identify where in the system there's an issue. Now, is the president's club anywhere in state, federal labor laws at all? Is there anything that ties back to why that would be mandated? No. Does it have anything to do with employee accessibility? No. Does it have anything to do with level three? Nothing required requires this. But employee performance may go down if people feel as though there is favoritism and that they're performing. And what that may mean for us is one of two things. It could be that maybe President's Club is something we have to have in place in order to get employees to the next level that we need them to get. How much money would we need to make additionally for that to happen? Well, the employee's base salaries are say $100,000, we have 10 salespeople, so that's a million dollars. And they each have a quota of 500 grand. So that means that we're at 5 million for quota, a million dollars in base. And then commissions, we paid 10%, that's another 500 grand. So in payroll, we're doing about 1.5 million. And if we're doing 1.5 million in payroll, and they sold $5 million, that means we have a 3.5 gross profit margin, right? So we're putting that in the business context over here. So $3.5 million, and it costs $500,000 to do a president's club. How much does the sales team need to sell for that to make sense? If we said, hey, if you hit 6 million, we'll do a president's club, would that go ahead and make them feel as though like, hey, like $6 million, that makes sense? Yeah, we're with it. Well, guess what that requires? That requires the employees to engage and tell you their feedback. No, that's not good enough. We, we deserve it anyways, no matter what the performance is, because the service team is the reason why we lost all of our good deals or that bad review we got. We're having such a hard challenge of selling things. We, we need a break, whatever it may be. And that is more of an employee retention and an employee engagement strategy, right? So that's a level five issue. And the reason why it's a level five issue is because it's not required. It has nothing to do with optimize, but it does have something to do with morale and, and performance. And in order to solve this problem, you need to negotiate because the company obviously doesn't have the president's club, but they do pay for the marketing team to do offsites. And we need to see why the sales team feels like a, the marketing team's offsite is a barometer for them to complain and to say something, right? And then we need to put the whole thing into business context and maybe even develop a process for, if you guys want to have a president's club, if you guys want to have some employee recognition program in place, right, then what we may want to do is we may want to have a form or a strategy or a committee or a process to evaluate that. That way, the company tangibly has a process for evaluating, well, why did marketing get it versus sales? Maybe there was favoritism and maybe just designing a process for us to approve those types of expenses or not is the very thing that will make the sales team happy in this scenario, right? And that's why when we go through this, we have to put the people uh, performance framework. We're not gonna just build out a sales, uh, a sales president's club. We're gonna ask, what's the problem? We really wanna identify the solution and we wanna know as a company, where does this problem fall on this chart so that we know, is it required? Well, we have to do it. Is it a performance thing? Now we know like what we're dealing with. It's a performance thing. So we want to be very delicate and thoughtful 
about how we respond. And then in that case, it would make some sense if it's really going to damage morale and damage sales, make sales go down. It's going to cost us more money to not put a process in place to evaluate whether or not that makes sense than it is to do it. And then that's when we build that. And that's why with this people performance framework, when properly used and in this order, you have the problem, you identify the solution, and then you use your tools, the employee life cycle and the levels of people performance that helps you navigate and figure out what exactly do we need to build in our HR department right now so that there is no waste. So it's not the old way where we're just taking everything at one time and trying to build a DEI program or taking everything at one time and trying to create uh, analytics or HRIS uh, analytics or reports that say nothing to no one, right? We don't want to throw the book at the problem. We want to be thoughtful about what's the context of the people problem in the context of the business and how is that behavior or the outcome going to impact our income statement. And that income statement, if impacted, whether we build a system or don't build a system, decide to create a policy or address it or don't, what's the risk versus the reward in the context of the business? And how does this leverage our resources properly? So I hope this was helpful for you, but this is the framework, the people performance framework, and this is how you begin to build your people performance system or your HR department in the new way, the more modern way. The people performance framework ensures HR not only manages people, but it optimizes them to achieve business outcomes, real business goals. And by aligning employee roles with the business outcomes, HR becomes a key driver of growth, innovation, and profitability. And that's how you get people to perform at your company. One of our clients came to us because they were burning cash and they only had six months of runway. They thought layoffs were the only way to buy more time. But after we applied the people performance framework that we just reviewed, we were able to find close to $400,000 sitting in their benefit strategy. And that's because they had never done proper benchmarking in over the last three years. We were able to not only save them $387,000, but we also improved the quality of their benefits. We were able to launch the company's first 401k match, and we were able to recruit two engineers that led to the client securing their first revenue producing client three months ahead of schedule. That is exciting, right? The current market is more competitive than ever. You know, waiting to implement a solid people strategy could cost you your best employees or leave your business vulnerable to legal risk. Every day that you're delaying, you're missing opportunities to improve profitability and growth. So don't wait until it's too late. Book your free call now. Learn how to turn your people into your greatest asset. And let's start building a people strategy that will drive your business forward. Don't miss this opportunity. Spots are limited. I'll see you on the call.